Thank you for your time and attention. I'm excited to talk to you about this research topic and look forward to the discussions. I've included a picture of a selective emitter from a 30% efficient TPV system and the reference scale is one micrometer. For this talk, there are three main concepts to discuss, namely TPVs, sensing, and the metasurface design framework are planned to create. For those concepts, there will be a discussion around the motivation, approach, and progress made so far. Thermophotovoltaics, or TPVs, work in a similar way to solar cells. The main difference being the radiating body is much closer because it is not the sun, and radiator temperatures are around 2000 Kelvin rather than an apparent temperature of 6000 Kelvin. There are numerous advantages, no moving parts, low maintenance, they're quiet, and higher theoretical efficiency ceilings. But the main ones are versatility of fuel source and the incident power density can be very high relative to other options. Sources in the literature reckon prospective TPV systems to offer the lowest cost per watt. And that makes sense when you consider device costs to generally be a function of their area footprint. Also something I added for comparison, the power emitted by a black body at 100 degrees Celsius is comparable with the solar irradiance incident in a typical day near the equator. So this is a technology that can really aid in the transition away from fossil fuels. Development of TPVs was stunted for many decades, mainly because of semiconductor costs and the need for components in between the heat source and PV cell needing to be operational at high melting points. In recent years, metamaterials have been considered for that role. For choice of PV cell, lower band gap junctions capture a greater proportion of incident flux and thus make it feasible to have slightly lower radiator temperatures while still maintaining efficiency. As we'll see in the next slide, recycling lower than band gap photons back to the heat source also becomes a more important strategy for efficient TPV systems. So firstly, without metamaterials for a second, the aim of the game is to match incoming wavelengths to the PN junction of choice. This can either be done from the outset through a selective emitter or by employing a black back surface reflector for the PV cell to serve as its own spectral filter. It has been shown there are diminishing returns to having both components. Only one is needed given high relaxation selectivity. This approach of using a back surface reflector to recycle photons and using the photodiode itself as a spectral filter was used more recently in a 40% efficient TPV system. In this system there were two kinds of tandem cells and it was mainly this tandem aspect that allowed thermalization losses to be suppressed. Metamaterials can complement and extend the filter function by performing a tuned absorptivity response. I'll just take a minute to provide this example. In lighting applications, a tungsten filament has an absorptivity of 0.45. And by Kirchhoff's law, emissivity will equal the same value at thermal equilibrium. The emittance spectrum is approximately half the black body spectrum at that temperature because of this. Now imagine we tuned a tungsten metamaterial to peak over the same wavelength range the human eye can actually detect. That would reduce all the unwanted infrared emission. And in a closed system, this spectral weight would shift into wavelengths where photons can be emitted. This would make the intensity far greater than what we need for a light bulb. But then we could put 10 times less input power in and still get the same result in lumens that regular tungsten would provide. For our TPV purpose, we can design absorbers to support a variety of PN junctions, 
suppress thermalization loss for cells that aren't tandem, while also reducing device thickness. And device thickness is an important factor because it's been shown to be a major contributor of recombination loss. This is important to address because widening the variety of photodiodes suitable for TPV systems is ultimately what uh, will allow this technology to be used outside of specialist applications. And just to mention another aspect of this 40% system I mentioned, the choice of tandem cell band gap happened to closely match well with their chosen spectrum of radiator temperature. This is a strategy known as direct matching so this is another area where we can widen applicability. So even with a view to develop a design framework for any PN junction, the approach for this PhD project is to always build with an application in mind and generalize from there. I have this analogy that probably needs more explanation, but I make a connection with how the Babylonians could happily discover and use approximate values for the number pi without having something rigorous from the beginning. Anyway, on the left, you have a three by three centimeter semiconductor partially enclosed in some brass-like material. And a device similar to this will eventually make its way into low earth orbit for wireless power transfer. Currently, it is designed to receive a terawatt laser pulse of 872 nanometers which is very close to the band gap of gallium arsenide, 1.42 electron volts. And ultimately, the task at hand is to design an absorber to match and perform a cooling function. On the right is a silicon cell, which is equipped with aluminium nitride and on the back cover. And this has already shown good thermal suppression while under 785 nanometer illumination. This is a sort of reference benchmark for the project. And the envisioned metasurface would strive to achieve a similar level of performance. The reason to include research of sensing in this project comes from the appreciation that a tuned metamaterial response occurs in the context of real world conditions. Therefore, the surrounding environment and any interactions should be considered as two sides of the same coin, whether you want them or don't want them. For potential sensing applications, I asked the lady who installed the PV for Northumbria University back in 1994 what she thought, and she broke it down into three categories. Environment sensing in service of PV operation, PV in service of the environment, for example, a cooler than ambient back surface, would prevent some water evaporation for systems installed over dams. And also she emphasized that multi-use dual purpose devices are very popular these days. The remit for sensing is to study the effect of environmental factors on the observed response. Fortunately, in this area, we have some very good working devices that are functioning very well. Here is a short clip of one of the devices functioning as a, a fog sensor. And just to refer this back to the TPV application, to make an illustrative point, is it foggy in low Earth orbit? Probably not, but from experiments like this, we can know if and when environmental factors are going to pose a problem. Or alternatively, when devices are able to perform a sensing function. Ultimately, the outcome of this project is to offer some prescription of geometry and material choices according to the demands of the, the desired application and frequency range. For instance, this circle ring structure, bottom left, is highly symmetric and therefore suitable when there is no control over the polarization of incoming radiation. There is also an open problem around selecting dimensions for dielectric metamaterials which have higher melting points, which may be desirable, but they are more unpredictable and non-linear compared to metal-based metamaterials. For feature-based 
parametric design, forward design can be done with simulation software. However, this can take at least five minutes per design, if not longer. So a more recent approach has been to use some simulation data as training data, and then have a neural network recommend the geometry. And in this case, doping concentrations of molybdenum disulfide. So I've plotted uh, in-plane permittivity of molybdenum disulfide on the figure on the left. And so by appropriately selecting the doping concentration, you can define whether it's dielectric or metal, and you can put um, bits of those molybdenum together in different lengths to have a, a curve that will match what you want. Top left, top right. Another approach I'm looking into is taken from biology researchers where it's not possible to boil the ocean and perform every experiment you want. And varying just one factor over time means you miss things. This collected data can then show the empirical relationship between cofactors. So on the bottom left is taken from two pharmaceutical companies that each fixed uh, one parameter, pH or temperature, and they ended up suing each other and didn't find the maximum uh, area in the contour. So on the right is what you should be doing, which is searching the parameters base, based on the maximum minima. So once this empirical relationship has been discovered from the various cofactors, I'm looking to use symbolic regression to find mathematical relationships between the various response curves, if they exist. And maybe they don't exist for dielectric metamaterials, but we'll see. Finally, here I have the references for the figures used in the presentation. And this is a picture of the actual 40% TPV system that was mentioned. Here's my um, anticipated timeline of activities for the project. As you can see, it's quite iterative in terms of simulation, design, fabrication and characterization of devices. Is there any questions, please leave a comment. And here's some extra information that might be used in anticipation of asked questions. Here's a study I did on calibrating with a loop antenna, one of the, the sensing devices. And I discovered the case of when uh, more noise would occur. If you have discrete port current uh, magnitude peaks before the device resonance frequency, uh, then you'll ha have, you'll see, observe uh, noisy peaks after that peak as well. And also the, the device peaks will be smaller. So I've got a predictive relationship for that based on the radius and of the wire of the loop and the diameter of the loop. Here's some pictures taken from our UV photolithography setup. And some extra information on uh, loss mechanisms.